Good morning. Great to see everyone this morning. Everybody's having a good start to their week, good start to their day. It's a beautiful day out there. Just got a few announcements this morning. It's uh, First of all, it's good to see some faces. It's been away for a couple of weeks with some sickness. It's good to see y'all back with us. Uh, Joe Smith, who just lives right around the corner over here, house park last night. Some of, some of y'all know him a lot, don't but he's, uh, every, he? He made it out okay. Just a total loss on his house. Uh, Jackie McDowell, who lives right across the street over here, is, uh, been, he's been in hospital for a couple of weeks now, but they moved into Chattanooga to the hospital this past week, so let's keep him in our prayers. Uh, anyone coming to the work day tomorrow, if you have some old rags or whatever, please bring those. We, we got to wipe a lot of drywall dust off of things. Any other announcements or anything that I missed? If not, we'll turn this over so we'll pray. Good morning. Join us in song this morning. We'll start out with There's Within My Heart. <coughs> There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of life's ebb and flow. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go, feasting on the riches of His grace, resting deep the sheltering wing, always looking on His smiling face that is what I shout and sing Jesus 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 sweetest name I know fills my every longing keeps me singing as I go soon he's coming back to welcome me Far beyond the starry sky, I shall wing my flight to worlds unknown. I shall live with Him on high. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know, fills my every longing, keeps me safe. Casting down their doors. 
I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me, a sinner condemned unclean. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful, and my soul shall ever be. Oh, how marvelous, oh, how wonderful is my Savior's love for me. For me it was in the garden, he prayed not my will but thine. He had no tears for his own griefs, but sweat drops of blood for mine.
all the drinks in the cup. Now, Father, we thank you for the blood that Jesus shed. We know that there's no forgiveness of sin without the shedding of blood. We're so thankful that you sent Jesus and he came and was willing to make that sacrifice. To us, Father, as we lift this cup to our lips, it is the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. As he was dying, a spear was thrust into his side, and out came water and, and blood. And to us, Father, this represents the blood that was sacrificed for us. We just pray we we'll take, we'll take of it in a worthy manner, which is pleasing in our sight. Through Christ we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Supper, we find this convenient time to give thanks for our, for our blessings. Father, every good and perfect gift comes from you. We're so thankful that you have blessed us so much. You've blessed us, Father, beyond what we deserve and, and what we need. We just pray that you will continue to bless us and as you see our needs. At this time, Father, we give that back to you that we've laid in store to carry on your work at this place and not only here throughout the world. We just pray that we give cheerfully and liberally in a way we're pleasing in our sight. Through Christ we pray. Amen. Search me, O oh God. We'll get the next song. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. Try me, O oh Savior, know my thoughts, I pray. See if there be some wicked way in me. Cleanse me from every sin and sin. Thank you. 
peace impart. Savior, at thy feet I fall. Thou my life, my God, my all. Let thy happy servant be one forevermore with thee. If you'd like to mark the invitation song in your book this morning, it'll be number 337 which will be, Is Thy Heart Right With God? Before Alan comes to speak with us today, we'll sing uh, Yield Not to Temptation, number 798 in our books. If you can, just stand with me, please. Uh, we'll sing this, then Alan will come to speak, uh, to speak with us this morning. Yield not to temptation, for yielding is sin. Each victory will help you that they live 
decent lives. They appear to be outwardly clean and upright, but inwardly they are just as rebellious as their evil counterparts. And in our text for the day, Paul turns the spotlight on individuals that we would use or call hypocrites. That is, they are people who would condemn the sins that we discussed last week. Remember that long list of sins that we went over? Uh, they would very vocally condemn those actions listed in the second part of chapter 1, but who themselves are guilty of the same things. They are not right with God. These people look right outwardly, but inwardly they are guilty of many of the same sins that their evil counterparts are guilty of. And in our text for the morning, Paul tells us something about the impending judgment of God against sin. In doing so, he helps us understand what the judgment of God is all about. And he helps us to understand who was going to be affected by the judgment of God. And so this morning, let's look at these verses and discover three truths about the judgment of God that is revealed to us. And specifically how that judgment relates to the hypocrite. It's a little bit of a lengthier reading than what we are accustomed to. The first 16 verses of Romans chapter 2. Therefore you have no excuse. Every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to each person accordingly to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation, there will be tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. But glory and honor and peace to everyone who does good, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there is no partiality with God. For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law who are justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these, not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. And so in these verses, we see three important truths, and the first truth is the reason for God's judgment. And herein we see the sinfulness of the hypocrite. Just as assuredly as the Lord's judgment is going to fall upon those who are guilty of openly sinful lives against the Lord, we can be sure that this wrath is also going to be felt against the hypocrite. We all know what a hypocrite is. It comes from a Greek word, and I know this is by way of review, we have discussed this before, but it comes from a Greek word that literally means to put on a mask. You know how that mask is a symbol of the theater? Uh, there was a time when only males could perform. And, and so they would put on a mask to uh, imitate a female, or they would put on, the same character would put on a different mask if he was playing different parts. And, and so the word hypocrite, has devolved in its meaning uh, because of its usage in religion to refer to someone 
who shows one thing but in reality is something else. He is an individual who puts on a mask. In the theater, nothing wrong with that. But that image has carried over and, and has developed into this idea of an individual who will be polite to your face but stab you in the back. Uh, an individual who will say one thing and do something else. An individual who never shows his or her true colors because he knows that showing someone my true colors is going to be at a disadvantage to myself. They pretend to be one thing when in reality they are someone else. And God makes it clear in this text that He is not going to hold that person unaccountable. He is not going to hold that person guiltless. Just because he, just because she, like the tomb, like the cup, looks good on the outside, God knows and judges the heart. And so, we see the sinfulness of the hypocrite because of his condemnation. One of the reasons God judges the hypocrite is because the hypocrite is assuming a role that belongs only to God. In Matthew 7, Jesus says, Judge not, lest you be judged. And I understand that that verse is oftentimes overused and misapplied. And, and we live in a world where the only thing that is it's okay to be intolerant of, uh, or to, intolerant of, is intolerance. But that doesn't change the truthfulness of the Word of God. And so it is not your place or mine to pass judgment on another individual. When we judge, we are guilty before God because we have usurped God's authority, God's position in the matter. Uh, the hypocrite will not go unjudged by God because of his conduct. What really takes the cake is that the hypocrite looks at another person and judges them for what they do. But God says that the hypocrite is just as guilty as the person that he or she is judging. Remember, Jesus also would say, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and ignore the plank that is in your own eye? And so Jesus is taking it a step further. Paul is saying that the hypocrite will judge an individual for something that the hypocrite is himself guilty of. Jesus takes it a step further and implies that the hypocrite is doubly guilty because not only is this individual judging another individual, but he is judging another individual for something that is of lesser significance, lesser consequence, the speck in his brother's eye while ignoring the log that is in his own. They may do the same things outwardly, or excuse me, may not do the same things things outwardly, but sin begins in the heart. Matthew 15, Jesus says, are you still lacking in understanding? Do you not understand that everything that goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is eliminated? But the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murderers, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. Jesus makes it clear in his preaching that to have sin in your heart is as bad as actually doing the sin. Matthew 5. We will all agree that murdering someone is not a good thing. But Jesus says if you have hatred in your heart, you are guilty of the same type of sin. Let us beware that we never have a hypocritical spirit. The second reason for God's judgment is the sentence of the hypocrite. Just as the wicked will be judged by God, so will the hypocrite. In fact, in the judgment, they will face the exact same penalty. Notice what Paul tells us about this coming judgment. We see here in these verses, verse 2 specifically, the purity of the judge. God's judgment of the hypocrite will be based on the truth of who they are. God's judgment of the hypocrite will be based on the truth of who they are. God's judgment of the wicked will be based on the truth of what they are. 
We must never forget that while man looks on the outside, God looks at the heart. The Lord says to Samuel, as Samuel sees the sons of Jesse and is convinced of which one will be the next king because of his stature, the broad shoulders, the good looks. Samuel is convinced that this is going to be the next king and the Lord tells Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And so we see the purity of the one doing the judging in the Lord. We see the power of the evidence against the hypocrite. The power of the evidence lies in the fact that it will surely condemn those who are guilty of sin, or excuse me, of judging others for their sins that they themselves are guilty of. The bottom line is this. Uh, it isn't the state of a man's body that is the issue. It's the state of the man's heart that is at issue here. You and I can be squeaky clean on the outside, but God knows our hearts. Many who sit in the pews of the local church and look down their noses at others because of their lifestyle will one day also face the undiluted wrath of God if their lives do not square with their hearts. Many are like the elder brother in the parable of the lost son in Luke 15. He didn't run off like his brother. He didn't squander wealth. Uh, he didn't eat, drink, and party his inheritance away. But he was just as rebellious as the other son. Because his rebellious came not from actions but in the form of attitudes. And then we see the shame of the hypocrite. These next two verses make the reality of the hypocrite's sinful nature crystal clear. There are three facts revealed in these verses that makes it clear. And that is, first of all, yes, he does delight in the blessings of God. The words used here indicate that the hypocrite enjoys a good life. The Lord makes it to shut to the sun to shine and the rains to fall on the just and the unjust. The truth is, God is merely giving the hypocrite every opportunity to repent. The hypocrite feels that because he isn't guilty, at least outwardly, of the sins of other men, that God must be pleased with him. But nothing could be farther from the truth. And so yes, he delights in the blessings of God and sees the blessings of God as being a stamp of approval on his life when in reality the Lord is just giving every opportunity for that individual to repent. And so he also despises the blessings of God. Because the hypocrite misunderstands these blessings, he refuses to repent. It is the very goodness of God that should lead men to love Him and to seek His loving forgiveness. We love because He first loved us, said the beloved apostle in 1 John chapter 2. But not the hypocrite. He sees the goodness of God as a stamp of approval on his life and therefore despises them. We should thank God for His long-suffering and His grace. For the Lord is not slow about His promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. That from the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3. John in the Revelation said this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and will dine with him and he with me. But the hypocrite does not realize that there is a need for change in his life. Because for him, it's all about actions. And attitudes don't factor into it. And so, verse 5, ultimately, the hypocrite is going to be damned by the blessings of God. This verse tells us that the hypocrite, instead of gaining favor with God, is actually storing up wrath and judgment. For one day, the Lord will take His grace away, and the only logical outcome is His judgment. Just as assuredly as the wicked sinner 
from Romans chapter 1 will face the judgment of God, Paul makes it clear that this is also true for the secret sinner. All sin will be revealed and judged by God. And hell will be just as full of hypocrites as the blatant sinners. So we see the reason for God's judgment. We need to understand the realities of God's judgment. First of all, it's personal. Verse 6. According to this verse, God's judgment in an individual's life is an individual matter. In other words, every person will be judged based on their own life. You will not pay for the sins of another. Another will not pay for your sin. The hypocrite tends to want to lump everyone together and judge them all by judging them based on his own and biased standard. God, on the other hand, judges men based on what he knows. And so we need to be careful about judging people based on what we think we know about them and be more concerned about God judging us based on what he knows about us. And his knowledge of the human heart is quite thorough. Hebrews 4.17 And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to his eyes with whom we have to do. Jeremiah 17.10 I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. And so, the judgment of God is a personal judgment. It is a proper judgment. In verses 7 through 10, we read that the person who lives right, seeks the Lord, will enjoy the blessings of the Lord, while the person who denies God and lives for self will receive a proper judgment. It's impossible to get away from this truth. Solomon reminded us, however, that how a person falls is how they will end up. If the clouds are full, they pour out rain upon the earth. And whether a tree falls towards the south or towards the north, wherever the tree falls, there it lies. Everything hinges on what a person does with Jesus. Men are never saved by their works, Ephesians 2, verses 8 through 9. However, the traits mentioned in these verses by the apostle are evidence of that individual's life. And that that individual is a believer and is striving to to obey God to his or her fullest ability. Salvation has always been and always will come through faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ at Calvary. And then we see it is perfect. This verse, verse 11, simply states that no one receives special treatment from God. No one can think that they have carte blanche to do as they please and still be accepted by God. Everyone is going to be judged by the same criterion. He doesn't single some out for heaven and others out for hell randomly. He gives all men opportunity. And He always does it fairly. And so our attention now turns to the realization of God's judgment. In verse 12, we read that it will focus on a rebellion. The basis for God's judgment is sin. All who sin will pay the price for sin. If they knew the law and sinned, they will be judged. If they knew no law and sinned, they will still be judged. And there are those who say this is not fair. It is not fair that God will judge those who had no knowledge of law. But the bottom line is clear. God's judgment will be realized by all those who are caught in their sins when they live, leave this world. That includes every person who has ever lived or will ever live. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Paul will say in two chapters later in the book of Romans. <clears throat> to the Galatians, he said, this is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? There is just one remedy for sin, and that is the shed blood of Jesus. Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. He is the firstborn of the dead, and it is only through his blood that we can have our sins dealt with, yes, forgiven. And so is this fair? What about people who have never been exposed to the word of God? Will they still be held accountable? And the answer to that question, and I know that this is unpopular, but the answer to that question is yes, they will. If we accept what the Word of God says, then the answer is yes. These verses, 
verses make it very plain and clear that every man has a conscience. And I love Paul's theology of conscience. Um, it's convoluted and hard to understand. But basically, Paul's view of conscience is, if you don't follow your conscience, you sin. If you do follow your conscience, you may sin anyway. Uh, and, and the point is, conscience is not a safe guide. It is not a safe guide to live by. But it is a goad that tells us the difference between right and wrong. And yes, there are those who have had their consciences seared. And this is why Paul says that even if you follow your conscience, you may still sin. Uh, but our conscience is a guide. And when the person allows his, uh, is, or excuse me, it is not a guide, but a goad. And when a person allows his conscience to be the guide for his life, he is headed for trouble. But when he listens to that conscience, as it does point out right and wrong, then it's going to ensure that that individual is at least marginally headed in the right direction. Now, if that sounds convoluted, it's because Paul's view is convoluted. Uh, it works, but yes, it can be confusing. And now, what is Paul talking about when he talks about the light of God? Well, in John chapter 1, verse 9, John tells us there was the true light which coming into the world enlightens every man. <laughs> every person who is born into this world receives that light. When the Lord created man, the Word of God tells us that He breathed the breath of life into him and he became a living being. It's a beautiful Hebrew word, nefesh kayah, breath of life. And it is what separates man from the animals. And so every person born into this world receives that breath of life. It's an ineffable quality that is beyond biology. And that light may be very bright for some, it may be very dim for others, but if the person will follow that light, he will be given more light, and he will eventually be brought to the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. Certainly men will be judged according to the light that they are given, but to reject a little light is just as condemning as rejecting a lot of light. But those of us who have been exposed to much light will face a much greater judgment. It is why in James chapter 3, James warns, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that such will incur a stricter judgment. It's why I have always said that I would rather go to hell from the deepest, darkest jungle in Africa than go to hell from a Church of Christ pew. The more light we've been exposed to means that there's more light that we are accountable for. And so we conclude by seeing that the realization of God's judgment will focus on a reality. There is a day coming when God will judge all men. Luke 12, verse 3, Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in the inner rooms will be proclaimed upon the housetops. A day when men will face the reality of what their life was. And what will be the basis of that judgment? The gospel of Jesus Christ. Man's eternity will rise or fall based on what he did with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And on that day, it won't matter about your accomplishments. It won't matter about your standing in the community. It won't matter about how you are perceived by others. All that will matter on that day will boil down to what you did or didn't do with the person, Jesus Christ. Did you receive him or reject him? Did you fall before Him in repentance? Or did you cling to your sins and stubbornly refuse to bow before the Lord? A person's eternal destiny depends totally on what he does with Jesus. He who has the Son has life, but he who does not have the Son of God does not have life. 1 John 5, verse 12. In Revelation 20, John says that I saw a great throne room and he who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, no place was found for them. And the sea gave up its dead which were in it. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death. 
And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Yes, I know that today's lesson was deep. I know that today's lesson was a little dark. But today's lesson is a part of the Word of God. And we are not faithful stewards when we do not proclaim the full counsel of the Word of God. Romans isn't a popular book. It's a difficult read. And it says some things that we're not always comfortable with. But we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be honest with the Word of God. And we need to hear the truth that while we serve a God who is merciful and gracious, a God who is long-suffering and patient, not wishing any to perish, that He is also a God of judgment. He can't be holy. He can't be righteous. He can't be just if He is not a God of judgment. Today, if you're not a Christian, you can escape the wrath of God. You can escape those things that we've discussed today by what you choose to do with Jesus. Will you confess His name, repent of your sins, and have your sins washed away through baptism? And, and <clears throat> maybe you realize that you may look awful clean on the outside, but you realize that there may need some work to be done on the inside then we'd be happy to pray with you and pray for you. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation today, Jesus invites you, and we stand and sing to encourage you. That thine affection been nailed to the cross, is thy heart right with God. Dost thou count all things for Jesus but lost? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crown and flood, cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Are all thy powers under Jesus' control? Is thy heart right with God? Does each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? It's always great to have Brian and Dana, uh, and sometimes there are children with us uh, on a Sunday. Brian always does an outstanding job leading singing. I always appreciate his selections. He's one of the most thoughtful. Um, Brian, and you've, we've talked about this before, Brian always gets the hard songs uh, selections to have to uh, pick out. Uh, you got me back this week, though, Brian. Uh, Search Me, O oh God. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew that song was in Paperless Hymn. Uh -huh. I knew it was. I knew it was because that song's been around forever. Uh, I knew it was because I know the owner of Paperless Hymn, and he uh, has told me that every song in our songbook is in Paperless Hymn. Um, and so I knew it was in there. It took me about an hour and a half of internet researching and, and various other things. It's titled, Search Me, O God, in most songbooks, but when it was originally written, the title was Cleanse Me. I don't know if y'all noticed the title on the screen, but the original title was Cleanse Me. Uh, so uh, an hour and a half of work just to get that song, <laughs> but it's a very, very beautiful song. Uh, and that's just one example of Brian always having thoughtful selections. Uh, Robbie mentioned the work day tomorrow. Uh, the announcement is in the bulletin. I'm going to be here at 8 because uh, I've got several things going on at 8, but we uh, are cleaning out some of the things in the, uh, I call it the junk room, but I think the more appropriate term would be storage room uh, downstairs. Uh, things that we do not need, we're not going to pack everything back in there, uh, and we need to get some of that out uh, so that the contractors can finish work in the basement. I told them not to cram everything back in there just for us to have to take it back out. So we had to get a second construction dumpster to finish up some construction debris. There's room in it. 
And so anyone who, uh, I know it's last minute, but anyone who doesn't have anything on their agenda tomorrow, if you could uh, help us out for just an hour or two uh, tomorrow, that would be great. Have a great rest of your day. I look forward to seeing all of you Wednesday. I'm not quite sure if that quite justifies the, 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 uh, the amount of time spent on picking out songs, but, but you're welcome. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, our closing song today, like I said, will be Here We Are, Restraining Pilgrims. Uh, welcome back to worship with us again next Sunday. Here we are, but straining pilgrims, here our path is often dim. But to cheer us on our journey, still we sing this place I knew. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansion dries, soon will be our home forever. And the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our feet are often weary. Throng our way. Here the tempest darkly gathers, but our hearts within us say, Yonder over the rolling river where the shining mansion dries, soon will be our home forever. And the smile of the blessed giver gladdens all our longing eyes. Here our souls are often fearful of the pilgrim's lurking foe. But the Lord is our defender, and he tells us we may know. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shining mansion dries, soon will be our home forever. And the smile of the blessed giver plans all our longing eyes. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we gather here as brothers and sisters in thought and belief. We're lucky to be here. We're thankful for having the health and freedom to assemble. As we go forward, let us shine an example of your word and truth to others. Be with us this week until we next meet again. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Yeah.